Welcome back everyone, it's Matimus and thanks for joining me on today's video. Hope you're having a good one. So we are going to be discussing a vehicle which I must admit, I'm going to eat my own words here, is not a tank destroyer. In the past, I always thought that this vehicle was. It has the same sort of attributes as the Second World War, similar kind of, you know, uh, tank destroyer concept, but this is not a tank destroyer. Today we are talking about the STRV or Stridswagen 103 S-Tank. Now this is definitely a vehicle that steps out of the normal boundaries for post-World War II tanks and we're going to discuss, as always, its overall features, its history and just my own personal opinion which most people don't care for but I always like to put my own little spin of what I think of the vehicle overall anyway. So let's just talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to saying that this vehicle is a tank. It doesn't have a turret but that doesn't mean it's not a tank. A lot of people will debate that particular fact but it just is what it is. The Stridswagen 103, popularly known as the S-Tank, was a Swedish Cold War design. It utilized highly developed suspension for elevation while the tracks actually traversed the gun, making it a very mobile, precise, and despite lacking its essential part, very very effective at being a tank. Produced at the height of the Cold War, it took over the combat role of other main battle tanks of the Swedish army. The S-Tank was the only tank to abandon the use of the turret since World War II, and this was quite a daring decision which really requires a bit of an explanation. This strange design gave the tank a very low profile, but an extremely high speed of 60 km an hour, or for those of you highly triggered about my conversions to Metrical Imperial, 37 miles per hour. Other militaries were focused on producing weapons which would guarantee the best kill rate, while the Swedes went in a bit more of a different direction. Obviously at the same time guys, the Centurion tank, a very capable tank, was around about that time too, and they decided to buy that tank, but also start procuring and designing their own tank. Their concern really was the safety of the crew, not the firepower of the tank. Not that the S-Tank really lacked that firepower though. The idea was to produce a very fast moving, versatile and precise tank that was easy to hide and cover battle groups from a distance whilst being able to fire and maneuver to a previous location or to resupply to the rear. And let's be honest here guys, during the 1960s this was a very realistic scenario for Sweden and a scary one at that. The country was not, and is still not, part of NATO. It defends along its history of neutrality, however such neutrality was threatened by the often unpredictable actions of the USSR during some of the worst years with the East-West diplomatic relations. The Stridswagen 103 was produced from 1967 until 1971. In this period 290 S-Tanks were built. A tank that was no more than 2.14 meters or 7 foot high was ideal for camouflage and hiding behind the hull down positions that they could even produce themselves. The decision to abandon the prominent turret of this tank was made after studying the casualty rate from World War II and the Korean War. In both conflicts, tanks were most often destroyed when their turrets were hit. This led to a major conclusion that the height was the primary factor which exposed the tank and made it very vulnerable to enemy fire. After considering options which excluded an oscillating turret, the Swedish designers decided to just not include it at all. Its main armament was the Bofors 105mm L74 rifled gun, joined with three medium machine guns. Two of these were fixed as an anti-infantry support, while one was intended to provide initial defense against aircraft and helicopters. The S-Tank was designed to be safe for its crew as possible. Its armor was extremely sloped, almost like a gigantic cheese wedge, which provided protection equivalent to 192 to 337 millimeters thick as armor. Its armor was actually between 90 and 100 millimeters. The low silhouette reduced the chance of a direct hit significantly, and the designers relied on the enemy to miss the target. It was also fully amphibious, which made the tank extremely adaptable. 
Its performance was deemed excellent on rough terrain, and it was to be the first line of defense against any potential threat to Sweden. Basically, guys, these things would rock up into a wood line, find a sneaky hidey hole, cover it up with as much camouflage as they can, overlook a long range position, and just wait for them to come. By the time the rounds have gone down range, it's extremely difficult to see that low silhouette of the vehicle, and bye bye, Mr. Tank. Although the new tank never really saw combat, it was part of the Swedish tank arsenal for 30 years, from 1967 to 1997, when it was replaced with the Swedish built Leopard 2 tank and its successor, the Stridsvergen 122. Since the S tank must stop to fire, the driver can serve as a loader and gunner. The driver and gunner sits on the left side of the commander on the right. Both have complete set of driving and gunnery controls and the commander can override the driver gunner controls at any time. Seated backward and slightly behind the driver is the radio operator who has also got a set of driving controls to take the tank backwards. Basically guys, this means that the vehicle is always primed to drive in the location that's most important at the time. For instance, if the vehicle is taken on a target, it needs to shoot and scoot quickly, the commander doesn't have to focus on looking at what's behind him, the driver to the rear is ready to go and can just punch it and off they go. That to me is a very, very clever, clever way of being able to shoot and scoot on the battlefield and especially with that low silhouette, you're really going to be able to put a few rounds down range and maybe just one, but one that is very effective and then get out of there as quickly as possible. One of the unique characteristics of this vehicle was that it had two engines. The main engine was originally a six cylinder Detroit diesel engine. The secondary engine used for boost power in combat or cold weather starting was a gas turbine Boeing model 553 that delivered 490 horsepower. The combined output of both engines compares favorably with MBTs with heavier engines that consume actually more fuel. As part of the total upgrade of all these tanks, that began in 1984 with a new Rolls-Royce K60 diesel which replaced the Detroit diesel engine. These engines are located up front to provide additional protection to the crew of three who are contained entirely within the hull. As mentioned before, the Swedish designed 62 caliber 105mm gun is fed from a magazine holding around 50 rounds. With the automatic loader, up to 15 rounds can be fired per minute. The automatic loader ejects spent cases outside the tank and if the automatic loader fails it can be hand cranked by the radio operator. Two crew members can reload the magazine through the rear hatches in 10 minutes. The main gun is aimed by lowering or raising the hull on special hydraulic suspension systems developed in Sweden. Traversing the gun is obviously done by turning the tank, which is actually one of its major design faults if it was to be engaged. If you take out a track, guess what? You don't get to pivot. Unfortunately, the advanced laser range finders and ballistic computers were not quite ready yet, along with fire control systems. This, however, was not a drawback since all tanks really had to stop to fire accurately. Yes, there was stabilized technology out there, however, it really wasn't up to the standard of which we look at today. Today, most of the state-of-the-art MBTs like the Makava 2 or the M1A2 Abrams or even the British Challenger 2 and most other Soviet tanks can fire whilst on the move, but the tracks of the S-Tank lock when the main gun is fired. The two machine guns are mounted on the left side of the hull and the third machine gun is mounted outside on the commander's cupola. Each tank carries a bulldozer blade folded under the nose that can be deployed and operated from inside the tank. Each tank is also fitted with a flotation screen that can be rigged in around 20 minutes. This allows the tank to ford streams and rivers at nearly 4 miles per hour, using its tracks for propulsion. If you've ever watched Thunderbirds, this tank always reminds me of Thunderbirds. Some aspects of this tank have been copied by other countries, but to date, Sweden is the only nation employing a true turretless MBT. The United States and the Soviet Union are known to be developing turretless models for their next generation of MBTs, but that is definitely speculation right now. The STRV-103 never saw combat, and so its design really remains completely unproven. However, for its intended role in the 1960s, it really did have some really good advantages. In 1967, Norway carried out a two-week comparative observation test with the Leopard 1, and found out with closed hatches, the 103 spotted more targets and fired faster than the Leopard. In April to September of 1968, two 103s were tested at the British Army School in Bovington, which reported that, quote, the turretless concept of the S-Tank holds considerable advantage over turreted tanks. In British Army of the Rhine in 1973, the 103 was tested against the Chieftain tank. Availability never fell under 90% and the final report stated, quote, It has not been possible to prove any disadvantage in the S ability to fire on the move. Finally, in 1975, two 103s were tested at the American Armour Center at Fort Knox. 
The trial demonstrated the 103 fired more accurately than the M60A1E3, but on an average of 0.5 seconds more slowly. So there we have it everyone, the S-Tank, and to be honest, a very daring, but also very brave, concept for this tank. I've got to admit, everything on paper sounds like it's a fantastic piece of equipment, and definitely a defensive vehicle. This cannot really go out there, hunt other vehicles, because it has no mobility in terms of, you know, adjustability of firing positions. It really has to sit into a position quickly, lock in its place, uh, dig into a good firing position, whether it be a hull down or behind some cover that's already naturally there, and try and engage targets. This isn't going to be a vehicle that can follow that battle forward really so much, uh, I've got to admit, I'm interested to see, you know, how the gunners feel with this vehicle, how accurate it is trying to move that barrel over and just to do those small increments. Those tracks and those gearboxes must be very, very well aligned to make sure that everything is squeaky clean when you want to make small little adjustments. I love the look of this vehicle, guys. It is just awesome. Awesome. I love how it's shaped such a slant that it looks like anything that will hit the front of that thing will just ping straight off. I'm sure there are other upgrade packages for armor that could have been put on these things. Uh, I must admit I'm impressed how long they lasted too from the 60s all the way into the 90s. Sweden has really, you know, taken this vehicle wholeheartedly and I, I appreciate and respect that, that they've done that. The gun, the 105mm gun, clearly a very powerful gun for its day, could do a lot of damage and pr probably knock out quite a few tanks before they'd have any issues with the Russians trying to engage them back from long distance in those perfectly camouflaged hull down positions. I also really love the feature that this tank can pretty much move up and down on its own accord with its suspension and that the driver at the back can literally just drive this thing back out of the firing position without having to look, you know, from a, you know, a camera or whatever. He just sits in the back facing the other way and off they go ready to go. A very unique concept with the two engines too, a really, you know, smart idea as well. I must admit as a mechanic it would have been interesting trying to work on two engines at the same time. Two engines that are actually quite critical to the vehicle, unlike an auxiliary power unit which really isn't a major deal, it's there to really charge the vehicle. But having the two engines is, is something that you would have to think about in a logistical sense. You've got to make sure you've got enough spares and parts to keep those two engines running, so just something to think about. Overall, guys, this tank would be very, very impressive to see in a, you know, training test environment. I would love to have seen the results in terms of modern day standards. I've got to admit, the fact that they put it against Leopard 1 and it outshined it a little bit, that's kind of amazing, really. Anyway, you tank addicts, it's time to go, and thank you for joining me on today's video. If you wish to see more of this type of content with military vehicles and such, hit the little bell button beside the subscribe button to be notified of any upcoming videos. I do have an extremely long list of requests from people that vehicles they want me to talk about, and remember guys that my opinion is purely an opinion and not stated factual information. I just like to talk a little bit about what I think of a vehicle, and honestly, I would love to hear what you all think about this vehicle and any other vehicles I've done in the past so go into the comment section leave me a comment and leave me a like if you did enjoy today's content all the best everyone have a wonderful day bye bye